Howdy, and welcome to the first episode of Primate Happy Hour. Cheers! So since this is the first episode, I'm going to go ahead and give some details of my goals here and try to tell you what I'm going to do with the uh, channel. And so the idea is somewhat stolen, but if you think about it, you're probably living on some stolen land, so I don't want to hear it. But the idea is for me to try to make primatology, uh, promote different primate species, and just tell them about a little bit of information in a sense at the same time of getting trashed. Cheers. Again, I'll say today's episode is unofficially brought to you by this delicious wine from Lidl. It is a pink Moscato, a little bit of sparkle, light and fruity, quite delicious. And so, honestly, the reason why I thought about starting the channel is I've been had it for a while, the idea for a while to kind of start it, just because, you know, wanted to spread the word of primatology. I'm tired of hearing people say calling a chimpanzee a monkey when it's clearly an ape and things like that. So I think just to kind of create a way to have it slightly more educational, but also a little bit fun. And that's the hope here, and I've been procrastinating, procrastinating, and pushing it back, trying to start this first video. But I think after last week's episode of SNL, seeing Jason Bateman, or whatever his name is, refer to a baby chimpanzee as a monkey several times in his SNL monologue, I thought it was about time. And so yeah, so that's going to be the premise of it. Uh, today's episode, I'm going to go through two different primate species. And then we'll see in the future if we'll do two or three or just focus on one. We'll see how it goes. But here's to go into nothing. Was that English? Who knows? Anywho. So, let's begin. <laughs> Let's begin. Uh, the first species I'll be doing is a gibbon species. Gibbons are probably my favorite. They're considered a lesser ape. And that's where they don't have a tail, but the greater apes are going to be your chimpanzees, orangs, bonobos, uh, and your gorillas. And then your lesser apes are going to be your gibbons and your siamings. And I'm just going to focus on two different species of gibbons today. So the very first one is my favorite primate species of all time. Unfortunately, it's not the lemurs that are sitting on my shirt, but is the lar gibbon. Look at those sweet little baby babies. Oh, they're so cute. And so the Lar Gibbon is the common name. It's also referred to as the White Handed Gibbon, which is not to be confused about the White Cheeked Gibbon. I know it gets confusing, but for whatever reason, they wanted to go off of those names. So we're going to refer to it as Lar Gibbon in this video just to kind of reduce some uh, confusion. And so the species name or the scientific name is Hylobatus Lar. And so that's in the Hylobatus genus, and there are several other uh, Gibbon species within that genus as well. And so, just a little bit about the Lar Gibbon, uh, besides the fact that I have a tattoo of one, because, again, favorite primate species. But, so, just location-wise, they can be found out in the rainforest throughout Southeast Asia, like Indonesia and Malaysia. Sadly, they did used to be found in China, but not anymore. And so, a lot of the depressing information I'm going to end up sharing for each species is probably the fact that habitat destru destruction, the decrease in the population numbers, and honestly, the biggest benefit, uh, the benefit, the biggest, ooh, the biggest at contribution to their decrease in numbers, decrease in habitats is humans. So humans really do your part to protect the world, protect the earth. We only have one planet. And, you know, we're not the only species out there, and we want to make sure that we protect them because we can learn so much from studying our, like, closest relatives, like the Gibbons. And so, like I said, they can be found in China, or not in China, but Indonesia, Malaysia. And a fun fact, they actually have the largest latitudinal range of this entire uh, genus. So not all Gibbons, but just Gibbons within the Hylobatus genus. They have the largest lat latitudinal range, meaning they can go higher to lower, I think. Check on me by that. You know? Cheers to this wine. Um, as far as just a little bit about them, so they are usually found high in the canopy. They're not usually going to be found walking on the ground. So you have your terrestrial primates. Biggest example I can probably think of is going to be your mountain gorillas 
or your baboons, but they are uh, the gibbons are completely opposite, so they hardly go down to the ground ever. They're usually found higher in the canopies of the trees, traveling around there. They travel in a sense of way of like brachiation is what it's technically called. And the biggest way I like to describe it is think about it as almost like you're on a monkey bar. So, And so that's kind of how they travel, just super fast and much better than any human will ever probably be. Because that's how they evolved. That's they have longer fingertips. They have curved fingertips so that way they can grasp everything better. And yeah, so uh, going off of that, their arms are twice as long as their legs, just about. And so for me, I relate to them hard on that one. Let me repeat, hard. <laughs> and the reason why is because I feel like my arms are freakishly long. And so, you know. To see a beautiful, graceful primate species out there with some extra long arms gives me hope that I, too, can be beautiful and graceful. Um, okay, what else, what else? Um, and so, they are referred to a dichromatic pelage, and so, I'm gonna break that word down, that's actually what I did my master's thesis on, so if you're more interested in that, I can talk to you about it, because that's why I graduated. But dichromatic pelages refers to that within the each species, the males and females are different colors with their fur. So if you look back at our lovely handy dandy picture, the male is here and the female is here and they're the exact same species, just they have different colors. And so overall they do range in color from overall species, so it can range from a black that we saw there or to the cream color. So those are both of the extremes that I showed you in the picture, but they can be a little bit of in-between. You might see a little brown in there as well. Uh, while they are dichromatic and pellets, they're slightly, almost barely dimorphic, meaning that the males and females are just about the same size. So males weigh about, on average, from 5.5 to 7.6 kilograms, and the females weigh, on average, about 4.4 and as, like, length and measurement-wise, they're about the same size. It's just that the males are slightly more dense, a little bit heavy, more base, a little thick, if you will. Um, they are socially monogamous, and so I like to say almost socially monogamous. So before, when we first, dis well, not we, I didn't personally discover them, but when they were first discovered as a species, it was thought that the males and females made it for life almost, and that they traveled, they had their infants, they had their offspring, and they traveled together. And so for the most part, that is the case. That is very true. The only difference is that we know now, especially when there's larger home ranges with large gibbons or the uh, white-handed gibbon, that uh, they will cheat. So they will creep, if you will, if you're a little TLC. That is not a plug. Unfortunately, they do not sponsor this video, but... Good song, nonetheless, nonetheless, cause I creep, yeah. but, so the idea is that overall they're socially monogamous, but if given the opportunity or a, a limited amount of partners, so within their species, within the uh, lar given, a lot of, like, one of the underrepresented resources are going to be mates, so if there's less mates, they might participate in polyandry and not necessarily that monogamy or monogamous behavior. In general, they live in groups of two to six, so the two is going to be a mated pair, and then they usually are carrying offspring, so they're uh, usually one offspring about three and a half years on average, uh, but that being said, that they still travel with them, and then that both uh, both sexes disperse, so it's a bisexual dispersal pattern, meaning both males and females will disperse from their natal groups, and where in certain species, you might only see the males leave or the females leave, but within the lar gibbon, both male and female are going to be uh, leaving their natal group. Get on out, hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back. Um, what else? What else? Uh, so females themselves are sexually mature around six to nine years old. And so in terms of humans, that'd be <laughs> problematic for obvious reasons. But with uh, gibbons, with Laura gibbons, again, six to nine years old, and and. Average, they for in the wild, they can live about to 30 years, I think, depending on how they're in captivity, whether it's a zoo or a, uh, like, what's the word for it? I'm not going to move on until I figure out this word. It's not a zoo. It's not a reservation. Let's go with gibbon rescue. Not quite the word I'm looking for, but it will work. So, with that, they are usually... Uh, 
going to be living up to 30 years old in the wild. And then as far as coloring, so again, that infant is usually going to be born the female uh, coat, and then they change over time. Sorry if this is seeming sporadic. It's the power of the alcohol, so don't blame me, in the words of Jamie Foxx, blame it on the alcohol. Um, To finish up, uh, last few facts. So... They are mainly frugivores, meaning that they eat ripe fruit. However, again, the same way, there's always ex there's always going to be an exceptions. And so I feel like as once you're learning about primates in school, especially like undergrad, you know, they tell you one, two, three facts and that's it. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's accepted. That's great. Good to know. And then once you're either getting out and doing their, your own research or you're looking at other people's research, you'll see that. There's obviously variations. There's going to be different uh, exceptions to every rule. So whenever you hear somebody say, you know, a large gibbon is socially monogamous, realize that there's going to be exceptions. There's going to be deviation from the norms. But that's not saying that the facts are incorrect. Just more so that times are changing and so are the species are evolving. So that's how evolution works. Uh, but besides ripe fruit, they'll also eat leafy plants. They might even eat some flowers. And depending on the season, mating season, temperature-wise, they might even indulge in some nice insects, which is fine. Don't shit on the insects because we all know that insects is a food of the future. If I cheers one more time, I'm just going to stop the video because... Well, all right, we're not going to stop. We're just going to go. Apparently, it's a nervous tick, so we're just going to roll with it. Let's pour some more, cause why not? Um, okay, so vocalization. And so this is gonna go one or two ways. And so I think it's a beautiful sound, beautiful, magical, peaceful even. But so with communication with gibbons, especially large, well, not especially like lar gibbons, they communicate in a song almost. They call it like a duet. And so they'll sing songs to each other, the made it pairs as well, but they also do it to announce territories. And so for me, I think it's a very graceful, angelic, maybe even beautiful sound. And so I'm going to first attempt to sound like a lar gibbon. And then I'm going to play an actual Lar Gibbon call. And then after that, I'm going to reattempt afterwards. So it's going to be a process. But, you know, I think I can nail it, but we're going to see. So here is me attempting to be a Lar Gibbon. So, <laughs> that was my attempt of a Lar Gibbon. And so now we're going to play a video of a Lar Gibbon singing. And so this is at the Pagnaton Zoo. I know I messed that up. So if you're from Devon, UK, I am so sorry. Or if you know how to pronounce this, I am also so sorry. If you work for the zoo, I am sorry. But... Here is the Lar Gibbon singing. See, now, is that not beautiful to you guys? Because, one, I think if, like, Mega the Stallion, this is a shout-out for you, this is a challenge for you, you could easily put a little eh and throw some hot girl shit on it, real hot girl shit, right on that track, and that would be fire because they sound amazing. But as promised, 
I did say that I'm going to recreate the sound after hearing it again, so I think it's more so like So I definitely think my first one was better. That is gonna be all that. Okay. And again, like I said earlier in the video, a lot of the things that you'll see are is going to be the fact that the numbers are decreasing. It's sad, it's unfortunate, but you know, if no one's talking about it, if no one's working for it, how are we gonna do conservation? How are we gonna protect these individual primate species? So currently, right now, the Lara Gibbon is actually listed as endangered on the IUCN website. And so, again, the biggest uh, contribution to that status is going to be habitat destruction. People are building way too many times. They're destroying way too much rainforest in the Southeast Asia. And so we just really need to focus on it. I'm not saying that development is incorrect, but we just need to find a better plan, a better safety network, a better way to ensure that as humans grow, that we're not limit eliminating the growth of other primate species and so there are certain cases with lar gibbons and just gibbons in general that and you can find a video easily on youtube i'm sure or just a simple google or if you're old school ask jeeves how you doing but uh so it's almost like that i think there was a recent video going around about the land bridge over a highway and so they're kind of doing a similar thing with gibbons. So when they're building roads through normal gibbon habitat or territory that they know is existing territory, there are groups traveling. They actually brill or build, build, build sky bridges. And it's kind of like monkey bars through four. So instead of a bridge going over where a deer or something can cross over, they actually have it where it's going to be almost like monkey bars across the sky and it's going or across the sky between connecting forests so over that highway instead of them trying to come down and travel across a busy highway awkwardly traveling with long arms and tiny little legs and so they're building them a kind of a bridge so that way they can also travel to the forest but not have that highway connect so obviously the better idea would be not build a highway through their territory but as the human population grows we both know that that's not really necessarily a possibility and so I think that the uh, sky bridge, or whatever they're actually called, they may be called air bridge. Sky bridge sounds like there's something like Avatar, the last airbender. But nonetheless, I coined the phrase, so if anyone wants to put it out there, I want my royalties, I want my money. But anyway, so that concludes our Laura Gibbon. Boop, 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 boop. And so... I do want to still go over a second species. So the second one is, again, obviously going to be a gibbon species as well, but this one's a white-cheeked gibbon. So remember, the Lara gibbon is referred to as a white-handed gibbon, but the white-cheeked gibbon is a whole separate species and a completely different genus almost, at, or not almost, it is. And so their scientific name is Nomascus lucigenus. And if you want to have me write that down in the comment section, just let me know. Or you can simply Google white cheek gibbon, and then that will pop in. So this species is also going to be found in Southeast Asia. Obviously, it makes sense. Uh, they're primarily found in Vietnam and southern China. So this one, unlike our lar gibbon, is actually still found in China. And so their territory is a little bit lower. But, you know, as long as we still have them around, that's a good sign. Um, they do have a close relative, and so for this one, it's uh, Nomascus concolor, or concular, maybe if we want to be fancy, Nomascus concular, concular, concolor. Nomascus concolor is separated, and so for that, they actually look drastically similar. It's almost impossible to uh, tell the difference between the two species. And so uh, the way that they are separated is going to be a geographical barrier. And so the white-cheeked gibbon and the nomasus con color is separated by the Song Ma and Song Bo rivers as well. Uh, just like our Lara gibbon, they're going to be found in the higher parts of the canopy and the rainforest, and they're hardly come down to the florist, florist, forest ground or floor. And so again, similar reason, they are milt. They are milt. Wow. Words are getting hard. But they are 
built, they evolved to travel higher in the canopies to swing on it. So they're just physically not built to be terrestrial primates. So although that they can, it's not the most, uh, not beneficial, but the most, I can't think of this word. Apparently alcohol removes my vocabulary. Um, it's not the most efficient. There we go. That's the word. Efficient. It's not the most efficient way to travel. And so they are going to be fine on that higher ground or the higher canopy. So unlike the uh, lar gibbon, the actual white cheeked gibbon is not sexually dimorphic. So both sexes weigh the same weight, almost on average about 5.7 kilograms. So obviously that's still very similar to the lar gibbon in general. But the idea is that we just see less differences in the males and females in this species versus the lar gibbon. Uh, however, this species is also di uh, dimorphic in fur color, so that same idea, that sexual dichromatism, so they're going to be different colors. And so here we know a little bit more information. I assume that it's probably the same, but just the information I found was strictly for the white cheeked gibbon, so I don't want to tell you wrong information. I want to make sure that I give you correct information, and if there's anyone interested, I can link citations in the comment section or in the description of the video. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't overwhelming you. Overwhelming. Oh, oh. Uh, but, so, like I said, the species is also dimorphic in fur color, and infants are going to be born that cream color. And then, so this is kind of cool, so I think, it, in my opinion, and then there are arguments for this, there's other arguments against it, there's different reasoning, but my thought of this neonatal coat or the coat of the infant at birth being the cream color is that it's actually the same color of females in this species. And so I think it almost serves as, almost as camouflage. And so there are predators that the uh, gibbons have to deal with. And so I think that being within, sorry, my dog is just scratching and scratching. But I think uh, being the same color as your mom is going to be, easier to hide, less obvious for predators, and they're not competing. They're not trying to make sure that males and females know that the infant is there. They're usually traveling in solitary groups anyway, so I think for the most part, in my opinion, that it would be that they're born the same color, that cream color as an infant to match the female for camouflage. Um, over time, the infants will turn from cream to black, and then they start to develop these white cheek patches, so hence the white cheeks gibbon makes sense. However, misogynistic as it may be, eventually the females will turn back to the cream color, and obviously the males remain that black color. Uh, the difference is usually the females slightly lose some of that balding color or the white cheeked color. And so the white cheek gibbon is kind of named after the males, and you can see that in several primate species. So, like the black howler monkey, although they're dichromatic. The females are drastically different color, but the males are black, so for, because men probably discovered them, they named it after the male uh, phenotypic trait, so go figure. Female is the future, future is female. I don't know what that accent was, I'm so sorry. Um, also, just like the Lar Gibbon, this species is going to be also a socially monogamous species as well. And so, although I don't necessarily have any articles or resources stated that they have been exhibiting polyandry behavior, I'm sure there are the same similar cases, just as like the Lar Gibbon. And again, like I mentioned before, you always never want to take anything that I say or any like one fact and assume that's always going to be the case. There's always going to be exceptions. If you think about it, there's exceptions with everything. If you're talking about the French language, there's exceptions with all their grammars and their verb tenses and everything, so... Pay attention. Um, unlike most mammals, however, though, so this is kind of cute, y'all. And so, like, I another reason why to like the gibbon. But unlike most mammals, uh, both parents, they share responsibility. And so usually a lot of primate species is more so the female will take care of the infant. And there are some, there are differences. There are certain cases, especially in New World monkeys. And so the idea is if... You can kind of hide paternity. So if you're mating with multiple males, there's going to be three ma male that think they might be the father. So all three are going to take care of that infant. So that might change. But with gibbons, not necessarily. They kind of know they're mated for life. 
And so they're going to protect their child. They're going to do the same amount of work besides, you know, the female's going to be lactating still and producing milk. But again, females are the future. A similar lifespan in the wild compared to the lar gibbon. So the white cheeked gibbon average lifespan is 28 years in the wild. And honestly, you know, they might be onto something. 30 years is a long time. And this got dark, so I'm not going to finish this. <laughs> um, they're also, also, also primarily frugivores. So again, same thing as I mentioned with the lar gibbon. They're going to be eating fruit mainly. But again, there's going to be exceptions. And last but not least, they are critically endangered, considering to the IUCN website. And so I think ultimately my biggest uh, goal of these videos not only is to just spread word and get information out there of different primate species that you probably never heard of or even knew existed, but also to kind of promote individual species that can maybe, you know, help out with conservation. You now know more about the lar gibbon and the white cheeked gibbon, so maybe you feel the need to go and donate or find some sanctuary. I think that was a word I was looking for earlier when I think I said uh, rescue, but sanctuary for given or whatever reason you want to donate money, you want to volunteer somewhere, please do. Humans are destroying this world faster than we can fix it. And a lot of species are dying, not just primate species, but as a primatologist, you know, I just want to shout out my different primate species. And if you can... If you have the time, if you have the money, even $5, $2, $1, it helps. So that is the Lar Gibbon. Thank you for joining in. Uh, I hope you liked this video. I hope you found it entertaining while yet educational. Um, yeah, so if you liked it, please comment and subscribe to the channel, obviously. But comment a different primate species that you might heard of or, you know, you just want to learn, learn a little bit more about and you want to see me cover. And... I will try to do that. Hopefully we'll have a second video soon. Thank you so much. Bye.